Our first speaker is a policy and advocacy advisor on drug resistant infections at the Wellcome Trust at, in the UK. Welcome, Sean Williams. Hi there, good afternoon everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes, my name is Sean Williams. I'm a policy and advocacy advisor at the Drug Resistant Infections Priority Programme at the Wellcome Trust in the UK. Um, for those of you who don't know Wellcome, we're a biomedical research charity aiming to fund science and support wider evidence-based change that will have positive impacts on some of the biggest health challenges facing us all. We have a dedicated drug resistant infections program through which we fund uh, research that contributes to the AMR agenda, but we also do a great deal of advocacy work aiming to encourage and motivate evidence-based action to tackle AMR. And a few years ago, we started asking ourselves if there were different ways that we could be talking about AMR that would help us maximize the impact of our communications and advocacy. And this project was called Reframing Resistance, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about this work today. But before I get to the research, uh, I want to talk a bit about why we need strong communications to support action on AMR. Um, over the last few years, AMR has been relatively high on the political agenda, and we've seen some pivotal moments that have really supported this. Um, the group here will know well the impact of the UN high-level meeting on AMR in 2016, um, and of course the formation and reporting from the Interagency Coordination Group on AMR that have really helped us keep this issue current and on people's minds. And this political focus has helped us make progress. We know that 120 countries have now reported development of their own national action plans for AMR, with many countries now in the, the second phase of those plans. But despite this, there is some reason to be concerned that political will on AMR is waning. In 2020, Wellcome published a landscape analysis called the Global Response to AMR. You can see a copy of the report on the slide here. And one of the key conclusions from this report is that the next few years will be really critical for the long-term success of the, a uh, the global AMR response. So maintaining momentum, maintaining the interest that we have on this topic will be really important. But a few things stand in our way uh, of doing that. And we can see in some places that action on AMR is waning. For example, um, as I said, national action plans are in place in many countries, but this hasn't always led to strong and consistent implementation of these plans. Um, in fact, of the 120 plans that exist, less than a quarter of countries report having their plan fully financed and with multi-sector coordination mechanisms in place. And at the same time, of course, COVID-19 is a major global priority and rightly so, but we see evidence where AMR mitigation measures have been compromised in the pandemic response. And we're now asking whether um, those changes could be setting back the, the AMR response. So how can we make sure that this political will is maintained? And one way that we can push for this is through public support, as we know that people have a huge role to play in reinforcing mandates for change. Um, policymakers, after all, work for the population, so public opinion really matters. Um, but firstly, we can ask ourselves, when it comes to AMR, do we currently have public support? Um, are the public aware? Are they interested in and behind the issue of AMR? And some public research that we conducted back in 2019 across seven different countries suggests that current levels of support uh, for, for AMR with the public are limited. Uh, our survey results suggested that there's a reasonable awareness of the issue with over 70% of people reporting that they were aware of antibiotic resistance. Um, and while this is encouraging, we of course just aren't just interested in awareness. Uh, as we know that awareness alone is not enough to equate to action and change on an issue. So we're interested to know how far people see AMR or antibiotic resistance, as we talked about in this particular survey, how far people see this issue as a priority and might be compelled to ask for change or take action themselves. But what we saw from our survey is that global health is a crowded landscape. Um, in the survey, we also asked people to rank antibiotic resistance alongside other major health concerns. And we saw that it tended to be viewed as a secondary threat. So as you can see uh, in the table here, in most countries where we conducted surveys, antibiotic resistance was ranked as the lowest or second lowest priority issue of those that we presented, um, often placed below issues like cancer or air pollution or lack of access to clean water. And so what this could point to is a collective action problem where people are aware of the issues 
but they don't necessarily have deeper insight or, or further inspiration to become more strongly engaged or take action themselves. Now, of course, I want to be clear that I'm, I'm not saying that other issues should fall below AMR in terms of priority. All these issues ultimately need addressing and we need to find ways to, to make progress on them all. But what I think this shows is that there's something about the AMR message that is not currently cutting through. And we aren't managing to convert awareness of the issue into the action that is needed to really make a difference. And this is, of course, especially a concern given the barriers facing momentum on AMR action and the real potential of backward steps that we're currently facing. However, we, we think we can really change this. We have potential to reinvigorate the AMR message and inspire people to help to create change on AMR by communicating more powerfully. And this is something Welcome explored in our recent project, Reframing Resistance, that looked at the use of framing to maximize the effectiveness of AMR communications. So first, what do I mean by framing? So framing refers to how an issue is explained and presented through specific themes and angles that can influence how an audience receives your messages. So the frame includes all of the different elements of how we communicate. So what we might start with when we talk about an issue, what we emphasize in our communications, uh, how we explain um, what we're talking about, and also crucially, what we leave unsaid. And from research on other topics like climate change, we know that the use of framing can make it more likely that people will understand, engage with, and support an issue. And so in late 2019, Welcome published findings uh, of an extensive research project looking at the most powerful ways of framing and communicating about AMR for the general public. And the objectives of this work were to understand how best to frame antimicrobial resistance, to drive policy action and increase public support and comprehension. So crucially, uh, thinking about communications um, to, to increase public support uh, that potentially leads to policy action rather than specific behaviour change. Um, and the other objective was to share findings with the AMR community to support cohesive and consistent communications. And in terms of methods, the work started by creating a baseline understanding of current AMR communications through in-depth interviews with experts and also media and social media analysis. And we then conducted quantitative and qualitative message testing with 12,000 people across seven different countries, looking to see what types of messages really helped people understand AMR and convince them that it was a serious issue that they had a role in mitigating and championing. And results from this showed us that the way we talk about AMR can make a huge difference to understanding and attitudes. Um, the evidence suggested that the same frames resonated consistently across people of different ages, um, people from different backgrounds, and also with people across the different countries where we surveyed. And by looking at what worked and what didn't, we developed five principles for maximizing impact of public communications on drug resistant infections. And I'll briefly go through those principles now. So the first principle is to frame drug resistant infections as undermining modern med medicine. So what we mean by that is that we should demonstrate how drug resistant infections are a cross cutting threat across um, lots of different aspects of medicine um, and infections that undermine procedures and treatments that we really come to rely on. So to do this, it really helps to use examples that are relevant to your audience. For example, uh, you might point to resistance making chemotherapy or routine surgery more dangerous. The second principle is to explain the fundamentals succinctly. The evidence showed that people really want to understand how resistance works, even if it's a, a very complex thing to be explaining. Um, and it also helped to include an explanation of the part uh, that human activity is playing in accelerating AMR, um, as that really helps us start to connect to the role that we all have in the AMR response. The third principle is to emphasize that this is a universal issue. It affects everyone, including you. We found that it's important to show that anyone could be affected, not only the most vulnerable groups in society or people in certain countries or regions of the world. And to help demonstrate this, we find that telling human stories is most effective um, and that actually numbers and statistics generally resonate with people less strongly. The fourth principle is to focus on the here and now. We saw that showing the current impact of drug resistant infections on people today resonated really strongly. And at the same time, projections of AMR infections or deaths in the future were much harder for people to relate to and actually, in some cases, made the issue seem less urgent and a problem for tomorrow rather than today. And the final principle is to encourage immediate action. 
uh, it's important to frame the issue as solvable. People don't want to feel like the situation is hopeless. And if you can share a tangible call to action with your audience, that really strengthens your message further. And so the evidence shows that using this kind of framing can really help support engagement in the AMR message. And we think we can realize most impact if our communications are aligned and cohesive. So as I mentioned before, we've been encouraging others to explore how they can bring these principles into their own work. However, these principles are certainly not a silver bullet. There are limits to what can be achieved through framing alone, and following these principles should not be seen as the only option or the only way to success. And so before I close, I just wanted to share a few of my reflections on this work since its publication in 2019. So first, the AMR frame principles are intended as a helpful framework, but they should not end up as a rigid template. Our hope was that the principles could provide helpful prompts for creating more impactful AMR communications. But if they're viewed as a rigid template and you're really struggling to fit all of the different angles into your messaging, then they're really not serving you. Flexibility should absolutely be baked in. And even just using one principle we know can help you shift into a more effective frame. So the second point I wanted to make is that evidence-based is best, but context is always changing. So the strength of our study really comes from the extensive public testing that we did with a representative group of people across seven different countries. However, we know that this only represents a snapshot in time and the context we're working in is always changing. Over the last year, for example, understanding engagement and, and perceptions of different health issues will undoubtedly have changed more than we might have expected back in 2019 when we did the research. We still have reason to think that these principles hold. Um, for example, the current situation may make people even more invested in the reliability of, of modern medicine uh, and, and different approaches that, that we use every day. But we should stay open to being flexible and responsive to the changing environment around us. Thirdly, I think specificity should be used where possible, but generalisation definitely has a place. So the question we have most often about the principles uh, since we published the work is how can they possibly work when they're so general? And I think we can all agree that specificity is best. The more tailored you can be to your audience, the more likely you are to achieve the objective of your communications. But the problem is that we don't always have the time or resources to work on such a granular level. The evidence suggests that using these framing principles can help you be more effective, to some degree at least, in your communications with any audience today. But we did see that enhancing content with examples relevant to your audience made things even stronger. And so embracing a blend of general and specific could help us make progress faster. And the final point I want to make is that it's important to be critical and realistic about the actions you point your audience to. Awareness and engagement in an issue are, are definitely really good first steps. However, we can't assume that action will result from communications alone. As I think many people have already said in, in various talks this week, no amount of framing or no amount of communications will help create change where structural barriers exist. And we know well that people can hold values and still not act according to those values. So you need to be realistic about the actions you point your audience to within a communications focused campaign. And of course, as I said at the start of this presentation, people have huge power as advocates for political change. So encouraging people to be champions who ask their leaders for action on AMR to be vocal on this issue is still a really great outcome you can be working towards. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for the chance to speak today. And I just want to highlight the link uh, that I have on the slide here to the website where you can find all the details of our framing work and also some resources for communicators that we've created to support use of the findings. Thank you, Sean, so for your so interesting uh, speech about this.